said, just read my check it and because it takes me forever to get it on there or <laughs> Commission for March 10th, 2022 at 7.05 p.m. Secretary, call the roll. Mark Hopkins. Here. John Miasso. Here. Austin Hopkins. Here. Jerry Callis. Here. Julie Capodococcus. Here. Jim Lemberg. Here. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the February 10th, 2022 meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Any uh, discussion, corrections, additions? Oh, Secretary, call the roll. John Miasso? Yes. Austin Hopkins? Yes. Jerry Callis? Yes. Mark Hopkins? Yes. Julie Capitacakis? Yes. Jim Lemberg? Yes. Next item on the agenda is number 21-13, Hanover Township Campus Extension Rezoning. Uh, they're looking for a comprehensive plan map amendment, plat of consolidation, preliminary overall PUD plan review, final site PUD plan review, special use permit. Uh, this is going to be a public hearing. If anyone has any questions or comments from the audience, uh, we have some witness forms back over here to uh, fill out and we will call your name at the appropriate time when we open it up to the public. We ask that you keep it down to about three minutes and try not to keep repeating the same things over somebody else already had. Okay, do we have the uh, notice ex exhibits? Notifications. Okay. Um, is the petitioner here this evening? Could you raise your right hand and be sworn in, please? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? I do. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Mary Cave, project manager with Thomas Engineering. With me tonight is James Barr, the township administrator for Hanover Township, Jason Estes, the project manager for FGM Architects, and Vince Mychek, project engineer with Thomas Engineering. We'd like to just provide some additional information um, in addition to what you've received from staff for their, their report. The William Tickness campus expansion will be in the south, 17.9 acres, directly south of the existing township town hall. Let's see if this works, there we go. The red marker there is the existing town hall. The campus is in that yellow rectangle just south of there. I provided a street view so you can see that area as well. The existing entrance to Town Hall is, is right here on Route 59. We'll be utilizing that entrance into the site. There's an existing entrance into the residential property that the townships bought and that will be removed. I'll let uh, Administrator Barr next discuss the need for the campus expansion and then my colleagues and I will, will discuss some of the technical aspects of it after that. Good evening. Okay. Before you start, you didn't get sworn in. Oh, certainly. You swear to testimony you're about to receive is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? I do. Thank you. Could you state your name and address, please? Certainly. Uh, James Barr, Hanover Township Administrator. Uh, I live at uh, 0N 550 Wellington Court in Geneva, Illinois. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak to the Plan Commission tonight. Uh, on behalf of our elected officials and staff of the township, we, we do appreciate uh, your time tonight. Uh, the expansion of the township's William Tickness campus will provide an opportunity for growth uh, of the township uh, that aligns with our strategic plan while preserving and enhancing wetlands and green space uh, on this property and making them accessible to the public, especially senior citizens, those that utilize the senior centers, Wells Victory Center, uh, and uh, youth uh, that are engaged in our youth and family services programs. Uh, the townships had discussions uh, with the property owner, the former property owners, the Cristofano family, going back over 10 years regarding this property. The most recent discussions started approximately 18 months ago, and the township closed on the property last March, uh, just shy of a year ago. Since that time, we've retained FGM Architects and Thomas Engineering to aid in the design, uh, planning, and annexation uh, of the property. 
The Township's Department of Emergency Services was, uh, was established uh, approximately 14 years ago and has operated here at the Fire Barn since that time. The department has grown to 25 volunteer members and over 200 call-outs and pre-planned events a year. Uh, most two services of the department include traffic control, scene lighting, decontamination, search and rescue, and severe weather spotting, damage assessment, and debris removal. Uh, the emergency services station uh, that's designed uh, for this property uh, will have 24-7 coverage for immediate response to call-outs with additional personnel called back in uh, for medium to large-scale events. The emergency services station will have bunk rooms, uh, a training room, communications room, a director's office, equipment room, and 12 bays. Uh, a full-time director will be based out of the station during normal business hours, along with two to three volunteer members uh, at any given time during the day. Additional members may be present for periodic meetings or trainings. Uh, usually, uh, there are two volunteers present overnight, again, for that immediate response. Additionally, most regularly scheduled trainings occur at the facility on Wednesday evenings between 7 and 9 p.m. and periodically on Saturday mornings uh, with approximately 10 to 15 people present. Uh, there has been some interest in what our intent with the uh, neighboring fire barn is, and the near term after this project would be complete, the township anticipates continuing to lease the fire barn for the near term and relocate some of our buses that you'll currently see along Route 59 to that location to get them, to get them under roof. Uh, in the future, uh, so the, uh, the immediate plans are focused on the emergency services station, and then after that, in the midterm, uh, renovating the main house on the property into a headquarters for our Department of Facilities and Maintenance staff, uh, and then improving the wetlands and making those areas around the ponds accessible to the public, and then longer term, uh, we're looking at adding a cemetery. There's been interest uh, in a township cemetery. There's no longer a public cemetery in most of the township uh, that has available plots. That'll be uh, several years out uh, further. Uh, and with that, I will uh, transition to uh, FGM, our architects. Preacher Ray Drake, do you swear the testimony you're about to give is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? I do. Thank you. Could you name an address, please? Uh, Jason Estes, FGM Architects. I am project manager. Uh, I live at 4N591 Shadowway Lane in Elburn. Thank you. Uh, so what you see before you uh, up in the upper right is the existing facility that uh, is going to be utilized for the office function uh, that James uh, spoke of. Uh, so the plan was with all the equipment, where do you put that when you only have a house? Uh, so the front porch that you see on the uh, front right of the upper right picture will actually be removed. And the bottom left is actually the, uh, what we call the apparatus bay addition that would be going onto this building. Uh, in fact, in the lower left picture, the bottom right is the existing facility uh, in the rendering on how it would tie in. What you see is matching uh, more of what is existing. So it is a pitched roof uh, with a masonry knee wall. It is a uh, metal structure, pre-engineered, or sorry, metal skinned uh, wooden structure uh, to be able to house all of their vehicles and get those under roof of what we were concerned about. Uh, in addition to that, there are uh, restroom facilities, decon facilities, uh, obviously um, mechanical space, uh, turnout gear, lockers, and equipment storage, which if anybody knows anything about emergency management, equipment is, well, anything. Storage is always premium. Uh, so in this facility, we are looking to uh, blend these facilities together and give them a good response zone so that they can meet their mission statement uh, for the services. And with this facility. I don't know this one actually. <laughs> I think this is the other one. This is the so there's two buildings on this on the current site, and that was one of the special uses we've requested. Uh, the the building that the emergency services station um, that Jason just spoke on that we call the guest house. Um, this is the main house, and it's located uh, towards the west of the property. Uh, I'll, I will highlight it early, uh, later, but I just wanted to show you that this would be a future phase. Uh, phase two is what we're um, calling it, and it would be renovated for offices for the facilities and road maintenance. I will hand it over to Vince to talk about some of the uh, key environmental issues um, and really amenities that are on the site. 
Another one. You swear the testimony you're about to give is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? I do. State your name and address, please. Vince Mysek, uh, project engineer with Thomas Engineering Group. I live at 3S483 Barclay Avenue, Naperville, Illinois. Um, so as part of this project, uh, there's quite a, a bit of permitting that was required through du DuPage County to address all the environmental and stormwater components. Um, so as part of that permitting process, uh, we completed a wetland delineation report and identified three wetlands on site. Uh, you can see a couple of pictures on that last slide of during the site visit. Uh, the first wetland is the largest wetland on site. That's that uh, yellow orange, yellowish one. Um, as part of the project, uh, the street and facilities were designed to ensure that that wetland wasn't impacted directly or indirectly. Uh, the next wetland, if you highlight the next one, it was on the, oh, maybe it didn't come up. Uh, that one we're calling wetland two was the, the second largest wetland. It was uh, quite a bit, quite a ways off from the proposed improvements, and there are no impacts to that one. And the last uh, wetland is in the far northeast corner, the orange one. Um, that one is going to be impacted. It's a low quality wetland, um, but we're, it will be mitigated with the detention basin that you can kind of see up in the northeast corner, which will be planted with wetland plantings, and then a prairie on the upslope. Um, and then as part of the site, uh, we also did an inventory of all the trees. There's approximately 2,000 trees on site. Each one was inventoried for health and structure as well as species. As part of the improvements, uh, we're actually going to be removing a lot of the invasive species along the improvements. And um, as part of the permitting requirements, a lot of the trees will be preserved and protected. And there's also a pretty robust landscaping plan that we'll be putting back a lot of nat native species such as oaks and um, hop horn beam. And I'll turn it back over to Mary to talk about the, uh, a little bit more about the design. Okay, as you could see in the staff report, we are proposing three phases of this project. The first phase is shown in the, the purple uh, over on the, the east side. That's the emergency services station that Administrator Barr mentioned. It will include just the um, building addition, the parking area around the building, and then the driveway into the property from the north. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, parking, we're actually providing more parking than is required. Uh, most of the parking for the uh, services station volunteers and employees will be able to park to the south of the building, and then we have extra parking to the north to be used for future uses. The building itself will be roughly 200 feet from the south property line, so that would be the, the closest residential area. It also is about 100 feet west of Route 59. We were, we're leaving any trees, any wooded areas that are not under the construction footprint, so it'll provide quite a bit of buffering, even just using the, the existing species that are there, but we're also providing landscaping to the south, just south of the parking lot, which would provide landscaping buffer for the properties to the south. As I mentioned at the very beginning, the existing access drive for the township will be used to, to enter the site. Those wishing to exit can also use that drive. They can also drive through the entire Hanover Township campus and exit to Bartlett Road as well. We've uh, prepared a traffic study. It's been reviewed and approved by IDOT already. Phase two is shown in yellow, and that right here is where that existing we, as we call it, main house is located. That would be renovated to provide offices for the facilities and road maintenance uh, department. We'll also be extending water and sanitary sewer to the site. Right now, it's septic and well. Um, it's, it's very light, but we are extending water all the way down to Sayre. That's the only connection of anything in, onto Sayre. Uh, we need to do that in order to loop the water main to make the water system uh, work correctly. We're also planning to upsize it to make it mesh into the, the village's water system better as well. There'll be a turnaround that we'll design during phase two, um, but there will be no connection to Sayre Road for vehicles. They'll turn around, have parking there, and then leave the site to the north. The final phase is shown in green. As Administrator Barr said, the township has had interest in a public cemetery. We're identifying that area in the northwest corner of the site, still leaving much of the, the tree buffered area around the, the, the perimeter. 
Also, the trails that we discussed are in this green area in the center. Uh, as Vince had shown, there's wetlands here, here, and here. Um, we'll be removing invasive species, really improving the quality of the wetland, and then bringing, bringing the public to them with, with the walking trails. Uh, as I mentioned, we are providing extra parking at the emergency services station, so the public can use that parking to access the trails once they're built. We're also building a sidewalk that will go from the parking lot uh, up to the parking lot for the existing town hall. So if there's ever a need for additional parking, they can use that area as well. And with that, we are all available to answer any questions the Plan Commission has. We appreciate your time in considering this development. Thank you. Staff have anything they'd like to add? Um, I do want to clarify the annexation of the property. So there are currently two parcels that are within the corporate limits of the village. There is one parcel that is unincorporated that they will be annexing. They are proposing to rezone all three parcels to the P1 PUD planning or zoning district. And they're also proposing a plan of consolidation to consolidate all three parcels into one pin, as well as dedicate a portion of their property for Sayer Road. Currently, their property line goes into the Sayer Road. Um, the property is currently designated as residential on our future land use map. We are asking to amend that to municipal and institutional uses. Staff recommends approval of the petitioner's request subject to the conditions and findings of fact in your staff report. Thank you. Uh, anybody on the commission have any questions right at this time? Comments? Uh, just a quick question, um, and maybe you, you said it and I missed it. Um, let's we'll say this was a great presentation. Everything was laid out very well. Um, how soon for each phase? What was the timing on that again? The first phase, uh, we are anticipating um, starting this spring. Okay. The second phase is two to four years out. And then the third phase, we're identifying three to eight years. Uh, for those walking trails, we'll be looking for um, IDNR state grants. There's a lot of opportunities to get some help funding those walking trails. So if we're able to get that sooner than later, those would come in as soon as we could get them. That was going to be my question. Was when, when, when will those walking trails be there? Yeah, exactly. I actually called IDNR when the first project first started and everything, of course, got on hold with COVID. But um, it's a great opportunity. and. Um, it would provide a great amenity to the area. Thank you. I have something I'd like to add to. Uh, my I have a couple quick, quick questions. Uh, the cemetery portion of the property, when will that be cleared of trees or will it? I'll let Mr. Barr um, interject if there's anything I'm not aware of, but trees would remain until they're ready to build. Um, we've had some preliminary just talks, kind of um, uh, high level discussions about them. Um, in previous um, jobs that I have done, I've worked with cemeteries actually, and um, so there'll be, there'll be a designer that comes in most likely to, to plot them out. Um, cemeteries are actually changing and they're not just the straight up and down rows as much anymore. There's a lot of opportunities to leave some trees in, create walking, walking paths actually, um, where uh, cremains would be below uh, seats. Uh, it's actually, it's amazing how much is changing. So um, no clearing until um, they're ready to, to begin with that. That area has some really great trees and uh, we have some arborists on, on staff and they'll be keeping an eye on, on what we um, need to clear and what we would be great to stay. Will there be buildings as part of that improvement? Excuse me? Will there be buildings as part, will there be a mausoleum building or a columbarium or shelters? Or no, no mausoleum, most likely some columbariums. Okay, all right, my second question is, as these phases progress over time, what are the, going to be the limitations on public access to the back property? Um, in terms of to the south or the walking trail? The, the whole thing. I'll let Mr. Bart speak to that. I believe it will remain a public. It is public property, and, and the intent is to allow the public to access the property uh, unless there's active construction going on in a particular area. Got it. That's, that's an answer. That's all. Okay. 
Anyone else have anything at this time? Okay, so I'm very familiar with this property. I think the plans are beautiful for it. Um, I drive that area daily um, on my way to take my son to school. So um, the question I have is um, having a senior mother that used, um, utilizes the township center, um, just the going in and out off of 59 is a concern to me that we're gonna be adding more vehicles from just the buses to the seniors using the property to people going to the township for assistance. And then also now you're gonna be adding in, it sounds like emergency vehicles for the Hanover Township. Um, is there any way to, I know we're gonna have an entrance off of West Bartlett Road also, um, to possibly, you know, break that out as far as who would be coming in and what, in and out of which entrances to try to avoid that you know, just all that traffic going out onto 59. That's a really heavy accident prone area and it's a very hard crossing there to, to, to enter into that section. So I do have a concern of adding a lot more vehicles coming in and out and then also construction vehicles Absolutely. once you start that. So um, actually Ida was really happy that we were getting rid of an entrance. Um, okay. um, they do, the fewer entrances on their state route, the, the less opportunities for conflicts. And that's an entrance to housing, you said? There, yes, and obviously right now it's not being used because they're vacant, but um, there was a, a driveway there. Um, we are requesting from IDOT a, a temporary construction entrance, actually. Let me see if... Um, most likely in this area, it'll be um, up to the contractor for, for staging. It will just be during construction, but that will remove construction traffic from the township entrance where more residents and people using the town hall and the senior center would be. So we are trying to find an opportunity during construction to keep those trucks away. Um, further future use, um, it's actually very low impact. Our traffic study, we look at peak hour, you know, the, the morning rush hour, the evening rush hour, and during that time, we're really only adding 10 to 20 trips, vehicles coming in for those accessing the property for the, um, the new emergency services station and then the office. Those using the walking trails in the future it's hard to predict right now, but right now we anticipate it's going to be a lot of the people that are already using the trails in the, in the campus now. Um, and then the higher peaks will be in the evenings when there's less traffic coming in and out of the town hall or on the weekends. Who's utilizing those um, trails right now? Is it just people visiting the township? I think a lot of the, the senior center usage. Okay. That's correct. The, the senior center and the victory center, that the current small uh, park on the property is really primarily intended for seniors and actually has a bunch of amenities specifically designed for seniors uh, between the victory center and the senior center. So it's primarily a combination of those two populations. Okay. Um, and you mentioned the Sayer entrance. So that is going to, is that going to be like a, with a, a roadblock like the other Sayer entrances are right now currently on that area if you go into I think the next street over on West Bartlett Road, it's, I think it's called Chavoy. Um, if you go through there, I noticed today that there's roadblocks leaning anywhere into the senior center. Is it similar what you're gonna be doing there? So for Sayer Road, there will be no connection oh, at Sayer Road. Okay. Um, the, the, the petition or the, the plat that we had to provide for Sayer Road, um, Back when, when plots and, and lots were platted, um, most of the time the, the property line would go to the center of the road. Nowadays, if you were to, to build a road, you would have property lines to the edge of the, the right of way and not to the center. So this is just here. The, so the property line actually goes right to the center of Sayer Road here. So there's this triangle that um, it would be in the best interest for the township not to own and we needed to go to the, the highway department. So the plat there is just to dedicate it Yep, we just cut it off right there. But there will be no um, access point at Sayer. It's more housekeeping than anything there. I guess I do have one more question. Okay. Because I'm imagining that, you know, once that third part goes in, the third um, plan, um, what about the, where would the people that would be visiting the cemetery be going in and out of? Because right now we're low impact, you said, with just you know, 10 to 20 vehicles, but that would not be the case if a public cemetery opens. So where, where would that? Right, be? so a public cemetery, um, at the time of, of a um, burial ceremony, there would be vehicles, but it would be 
um, very sporadic, but they would use, they would come in and use this, turn around and come back out. Um, and there would be, this is phase three, final design for engineering, would, staff would, would uh, prove any other traffic um, pieces in there, extra parking, et cetera. So that would be, that would come during the design of phase three. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions or comments? No. no. Okay, at this time I'll open it up to the public. <coughs> uh, John Villavananis. Can you state your name and address, please? John Valavanis, 8 North, 194 Naperville Road, Bartlett. And Naperville Road is also connected to Sayre. And I just saw today um, for the first time that you are not connecting to Sayre. So if you could update your website, um, because the public records do show, that's one reason I'm here. The public records show that there's a connection to Sayre. Um, one of my concerns are environmental. I mean, we have a lot of wild animals out in that area. and how you're gonna upset them or relocate them, what the plan is with that property. Uh, secondly, you've addressed those are like 2,000 trees there. Um, if you're gonna put a cemetery in, you know, it's one thing about golf courses and cemeteries is you gotta take a lot of trees out. And our concern is that the wildlife protection for the, the trees that's there. And then your picture of the service building or the maintenance building depicted several lights on the side of it, which would be illuminated, I'm assuming, at night. And that's gonna bring a lot of different things to the neighborhood, distractions to the wildlife, as well as to our neighbors, having these lights glaring in our backyards all hours of the night, because you're gonna want security around there. That's a given. And so I'd like to know what's gonna be done to buffer that for us in making sure that we're not disrupted. And then also the noise factor if it is a maintenance building, again, thank you for putting that up. If it is a maintenance building, what type of noise can we expect to hear? Um, if you come out to that area, and I welcome you all to come to my backyard, kind of like a hill and a little bit of a valley, and you hear every noise, I can hear the train three miles away, and just the trestle, the, the, uh, the rails and the tracks. So noise coming from that will also be uh, intrusive to us. And then I last want to thank you for your service and being on this board. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sure, we can address some of those. Uh, first, lighting are um, LED lights that are more of a dark sky light. They don't shine up, they just shine down, and there's no spillover um, even past a little bit past the parking lot. And as I said, we're 200 feet from the south property line and 100 feet from the east property line. So we don't anticipate much uh, light um, pollution is what they call it. Um, and then sound wise, I know we, I discussed with the, the township and kind of the great thing about this emergency services station is when I first worked on it, all, I immediately thought of ambulances, fire trucks, loud, um, but it's more them getting called out to help with traffic control, to help with um, weather spotting, so it's not gonna be con like sirens and, and things that would disrupt the area. And then, of course, if it, they are maintaining the, the uh, vehicles, there's doors um, and there's garage doors to keep that work inside. Um, in terms of uh, the animals and the environmental am impact, um, we've actually identified some trees that are habitats for different native species. Some are dead, and we need to keep some dead trees. So we're going, we're going to keep some dead trees. We're going to get rid of invasive species that are not allowing the, the native flora to grow. So um, we're trying to provide a great habitat for the animals that are there. It's kind of a, a gem in this area, and so we want to keep it that way. David Trupiano. State your name and address, please. David Trupiano, 348 Sayer Road. Um, so if you can go back to that previous picture. 
with the multi-phase. So number one would be around the cemetery is our concern. I'm, I'm here with many of the neighbors, the neighbor that butts up directly left adjacent to that cemetery. Uh, I live right at the water line uh, on that corner of Sayer Road on the other side. And then all of those uh, plots of land at the on the bottom south portion of there, lots of people live on Preserve Trail that are also here today. So our concerns, number one, with the cemetery is uh, my daughter, as well as all of our kids, play in that backyard right next to that cemetery. That is, there are wells at those properties, so we're concerned of contamination from those wells uh, from the cemetery, any seepage. So that would definitely be a major concern for us, as well as obviously visitors and just property value in itself. It sounds like we're just trying to f find a plot of land for how many, diff I'm curious how many plots would actually be there from the cemetery side. Um, so that's, that's our concern from the cemetery. And then uh, the water line, yes, that, we agree. Hey, the walking trail is a fantastic am an amenity, but who's gonna use it? The people that work there? We would love a walking trail access where that water line is to give us uh, availability. We do not have a sidewalk down Sayre Road, so having access to that, to that walking trail would be ideal for us. Um, and there's a huge plot of land there where that water line ro rolls. Like, if you could give us a park or something, there are so many kids on that portion right there that are constantly crossing the street. So it's a, that's the most dangerous part of Sayer Road. I live on that bend. People are going 40 miles an hour around that bend. So it's a huge concern for us as well. Um, and if there was ability to even put a speed hump right there with some sort of access, a walking path to then get to either a park and definitely those walking trails would be a request for us. Thank you. I'll address a few. Um, in terms of the cemetery, um, in terms of contamination, I believe all the things will be, be sealed and uh, we don't anticipate any. It's hard to, this is in the future and obviously there would be design that would be done during the cemetery. So if there's any concerns that we'd want to make sure that the staff would want us to consider during the cemetery, we can consider that during the, during the design. Um, walking trail connection to the neighborhood, I think that's a great idea. And this is schematic. Um, it's where we think it can go, but it's definitely not the final approved site plan for future phases. Um, so we can just add that line in there and try to get some money for it. So um, in terms of traffic calming, um, that would be a separate issue for the highway department that we can't address to speed hump, but um, hopefully we can provide some amenities to the neighborhood as well. Saba? Is there, okay, you're Go ahead. still in public. Are we done? Saba Hussein? That, that's all I have. That's all? Yep. Anyone else in the audience have a question or comment? We have some forms if you want to fill out. Come up here and state your question, comment, and then you can fill out one of the forms afterwards, OK? Or you have one? Yeah, I do, but I just had one simple question. State your name and address. This is Fred Bappert. I'm 1126 Preserve Trail in Fartlett. Um, I just had. Um, uh, concern about are they putting any kind of fencing where the properties abut to this yeah. development here? Or? Okay, sure. That was a question. <laughs> Thank you. I'm getting my workout today. I love it. Um, fencing right now is not required or proposed because we're leaving a landscaping buffer around the, the entire site. So that existing tree stands that are around there will be preserving. Thank you. Sir, did you have that uh, witness form filled out? Yeah. Could you hand it in to staff, please? Yes. Go ahead. State your name and address. My name is Connor Keough. Um, I'm directly west. Um, I'm at 8N135 Naperville Road. It's a new construction home. Um, I think my Biggest concern of the whole project, as well as Carrie and Teresa's, is the cemetery alone. Um, pretty much about contamination. Yeah, it's sealed, but it's only sealed to a certain extent. The um, World Health Organization um, states that a cemetery shouldn't be any closer than 800 and change feet 
so 820 something I believe is what it is to a water source um, carries well is approximately 200 from um, the southwest um, corner, corner of the cemetery mine is maybe 320 ish um, so I mean like I said I mean cemetery is the biggest concern um, for obviously our drinking water um, it might take a couple years for contaminants to perk down to our drinking water. It depends how, um, depends how deep the well is. I don't know how deep Carries is. Um, I just finished drilling my well, um, which is 225 feet. Um, and really, I mean, the other, he already stated, but it's the walking pass. Um, and I know you said the highway of transportation, so the speed humps as well, so. Thank you. You have the form you can fill out and thank you. As a part of phase three, we could definitely take a look at the groundwater. I will say that the whole site drains to, um, the wetlands are a low spot, that's why they hold water. Um, usually, groundwater flows actually still in the same direction as the surface water if it was percolating down. So everything is actually heading south and to the east, um, kind of south into the center and then to the northeast, actually. But um, as a part of phase three, we could definitely take a look and make sure that the wells aren't drawing down and changing the, the flow of the groundwater. But um, just from my, my experience, things usually tend to flow it wants to go to the northeast in this site. It flows down, but it actually still, um, a lot of times in the surface indicates also how things are flowing underground. And we can get a groundwater specialist in and, and take some more information, but in general, if the, the, the flow of land is moving in one area, the flow of groundwater is actually in that area as well, unless there is hard bedrock or something um, preventing it from flowing the way it wants to go. If you think about if you're moving from an upper area and you're going down into a, a river or a riparian area, groundwater is actually flowing that same way, just up much farther down. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. So, the water just Yeah, and we can take a look at that in phase three design. Um, this is schematic, this is for concept and to allow this use, and uh, we can address any staff concerns at that time, which obviously would reflect residential concerns. Phase two and three would have to come back for final approval. So there would be future submittals as part of that. Okay. Anyone else in the audience have a question or comment? I think for uh, phase three, it should really, you know. Where'd you come up? Um, I think I think phase three really needs to be considered as if we're saving trees I mean how many burial spots are we actually going to have because if we're saving all these trees and then we're ha is it really worth having a cemetery at all um, and especially like I said World Health Organization is 800 plus feet from uh, drinking uh, um, water source so. I would request that um, we still continue to keep phase three in your voting tonight, but if you'd like to add any conditions on that, um, that way we, we could move forward with doing design in the future um, and before coming back to, to the council and to the commission. Okay, if there's no one else, then I'm gonna close this portion of the public hearing. Anyone on a want have any questions or comments? Yeah, I just want to clarify what, uh, Christy, what you just said is that future phases of this project, 
are going to be submitted for public review so that when the time comes tonight we would be approving a use then as part of the PUD Correct. right now they're requesting approval of the phasing plan and this preliminary mm -hmm. overall PUD plan yeah specifically with plans. regard to the layout of the paths and a proposed layout for the cemetery in that zone we'd see that later correct yeah. right for public review okay anyone else okay then I guess I'm looking for a uh, motion to approve the petitioner's request for rezoning an overall preliminary PUD plan uh, final site PUD plan review for phase one Plat of consolidation, amendment to the future land use plan, and a special uses permit to the following conditions and findings of fact. So moved. Second. Any other things to be added? Nope. Secretary called the roll. Austin Hopkins? Yes. Jerry Callis? Yes. Mark Hopkins? Yes. Julie Capitakakis? Yes. John Miasso? Yes. Jim Lemberg? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> Next item on our agenda is going to be um, number 21-12, Grassland Subdivision. It's going to have a final subdivision PUD plat and a phase one final PUD plan. We will uh, start as soon as the uh, audience clears. They were mostly for this. <laughs> This is not a public hearing, and you know, so. Okay, uh, next item was the Grasslands Final Subdivision. Is staff going to give us a background? Yes, I am. If you recall, last year you reviewed a preliminary um, plat of subdivision and a preliminary PUD plan for the Grassland Subdivision. There was a development agreement that was also approved by the Village Board at that time. The property was to be developed in three phases, and the petitioner has returned for final plat and final PUD plan for phase one. If you recall, there are three pods proposed as part of this. There are, um, there's a total of 231 dwelling units. The traditional single family pod has 81 traditional single family homes. There are 60 active adult ranch homes and there are 90 active adult duplexes. The plan identifies a curb cut on West Bartlett Road as well as one on Naperville Road. There is a bike path system that goes throughout um, the property. It comes down through a park site that will be dedicated to the park district. They're also proposing um, a bike path that would go underneath the rail, or Route 59 and then come down on the east side of, West Bar of Route 59. The petitioner is also installing a sidewalk along the north side of West Bartlett Road that will connect to the future intersection improvements um, at 59 and West Bartlett. There is a nine foot tall berm along West Bartlett Road and Naperville Road that's also heavily landscaped. Um, lot 197 is shown on the plan of subdivision to create the lot. However, that will be a future phase three for commercial development. The petitioner submitted a revised traffic study, which was reviewed by the village's traffic consultant who concurred with the findings in the study. The final PUD plat and final PUD plan for phase one are in substantial compliance with the preliminary plat 
dated March 20th, last revised March 21st, 2021, and the preliminary PUD plan dated January 29th, last revised June 25th. Staff recommends approval of the petitioner's request subject to the findings of fact and conditions in your staff report. Okay, thank you. I have a question of staff. Uh, at, uh, passageway underneath the uh, 59 by the railroad tracks. Has anyone from staff been out there to look at that? We have seen what it looks like. It's something that we have to work on in the future. We're gonna apply for grants because we do know that there's grading out, grading concerns out there. There's gonna be enough room for putting a path next to those railroad tracks? There is a room within the right of way, yes. Well, you know, there's two tracks out there, right? Because they have on their uh, phase one here, they only show one track going through there. But there's two tracks out there. And those tracks, that, the closest one that you're referring to for the bicycle path or walkway, whatever, it can't be less than 10 feet from those tracks. And those trains override those tracks. If you recall, when this came through preliminarily, we showed an exhibit of how they handled the bike path go on Route 59 that goes under Lake Street, and they cut into the wall to make room for there to be a bike path. So they'd be doing something similar that you would see when you drive on 59 under Lake Street. There's a bike path that they, they modified the wall to make room for a bike path. So they're gonna cut that concrete wall that goes on an angle, they're gonna cut through that to put it in. Correct. What kind of safety barricades, fences are gonna be along the northern part of it there where the tracks are? That will be done when they submit engineering plans for that portion of the bike path. Would you let your kids go underneath that bridge when there's a train going at 40 miles an hour? There would be safety con considerations that are looked at whenever anyone designs a bike path. You know, that's a disaster waiting to happen. Who's gonna maintain that? Who's gonna watch the safety? Is the police department gonna go down there and put up a camera or something to watch for safety? You know, when somebody finds out that people are going underneath there, in today's world, somebody's gonna get stopped. That is not a good safety plan to be thinking about putting it up walkway underneath that bridge so far away from civilization. I think when the engineering comes in, we'll have a much better handle on it. And I think that there, there's no way the village is going to construct something that's not going to be safe. And, and we're going to apply for grants, and we won't get any grants if it's not going to be safe. So, um, as far as we know, there's about 20 feet there of property on that narrow strip. Um, and we think it's possible. And, and, we, and we will ensure that it's going to be safe. That's possible. Okay. <laughs> I have a question about Is the petitioner apartment? here this evening? Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Would you like to add anything? Name, sure. State your name and address, please. Sure. Uh, my name is Dan Olson with Crown Community Development. Uh, my address is 36W601 Lancaster Road in St. Charles, Illinois. Uh, yeah, so our development agreement, uh, we did propose that. We had a lot of discussions with staff and, and with council actually about bike paths and how to get pedestrians safely across um, <coughs> off 59, right? And, you know, there was um, a, a bridge over is not practical because of grading issues and cost and space limitations. It also shields the commercial. So we had, we had actually proposed the crossing underneath Route 59, similar to, as Christy had mentioned, similar to the crossing AC just to the north at Lake Street. Um, the development agreement requires that we, we design and submit a plan to the village for approval within six months of final plat approval. So that's our obligation, we'll be doing that. Um, and part of that plan will be safety, the safety considerations. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, um, so the path Similar to the route 50 or the Lake Street crossing, the path actually will be, as Chrissy mentioned, on the opposite side of the piers that are there right now. There will be fencing along that. Plus, once it gets beyond that, there's some grade drops off. It goes through a wetland area. We're proposing a boardwalk type pathway through that area with rails on the side, so that'll deter 
you know, pedestrians from leaving the path and going onto the railroad tracks. Um, but we think it will be approved. It will need the approval of the village. It will need the approval of IDOT, and it will need um, approval from the railroad as well. So we think um, it can be designed safely. We're confident that it'll be, you know, when we submit our plan, that'll be vetted out by um, numerous agencies, including the village, to make sure that it is. Is that path taking any easement away from the ra uh, railroad? The other no. side of this pilot? No, it's outside. It's a railroad right away, so it'll be outside. It's a 20-foot. Um, the we'll, we'll call it the panhandle, the finger that goes through there. It's a 20-foot, 20, 20 feet wide. The path is 10 feet wide. Um, you don't need any grading beyond it if it's a boardwalk, right? All you need is 10 feet. It sits on piers, it's a boardwalk. You've seen it if you've been on the Fox River Valley trails, there's a numerous areas that are like that. So it doesn't need additional grading beyond um, the, the path itself, or the boardwalk itself at that point. And I, that is okay with you taking away part of the embankment that holds the bridge up? It, it's, if you take a look at the, the plan just to the north, or how they did it just to the north, yeah. It, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm not a structural engineer, but yes, it can be done. And it was done just to the north. Anyone else have a question or two? It, yeah, I, I should mention also, we have, we, have, um, we have met with IDOT, we have proposed it. They haven't committed to our plan yet because they haven't seen our plan yet, um, but they were not opposed to that plan because they've, they've done it before. So obviously, uh, any structural integrity issues, we'll have to uh, make sure we uh, address that. We'll accommodate any concerns that they have. While you're up here, um, I wanted to ask about the land that you're planning on putting playgrounds in on the property. That looks like that might be backing also to railroad, or am I incorrect with that? So there's two parcels that we are proposing to deed to the uh, park district. They're very interested in the two parcels. Um, yeah, that, that's one parcel that's 10 acres, roughly 10 acres, and then it's there, uh, and that's, you can see, there will be, there's a wetland there, we're preserving the majority of it, there's a little bit that we're going to have to mitigate for, um, but our, you know, what they've requested, what their ordinance requires is that we, we clear cut the area, we provide uh, a flat um, active recreation areas for ball fields or whatever they decide to do, um, but they, uh, they made it clear any programming for that or any fields or playground equipment all that they will be constructing that and they'll determine what their needs are for this area and it'll be their obligation to do but they did not want to commit to anything at this point i suspect there will be at least a playground there i suspect there'll be ball fields there what kind of ball fields who knows there's you know there's a lot of different sports out there so i think it's going to be um they're going to determine that based on what their needs are as a, as a district as a whole could you show with a pointer exactly where the area is for the park? So it'll be that whole. That's it right there. Yeah. Okay. The the wetland that you see there, the the um, the oval there, yeah, that is a wetland area that's going to be preserved for the most part with you know minor infringement. The detention that you see to the left is not part of that dedication. They don't take ownership of detention areas, so that'll be maintained, owned and maintained by the HOA. Um, so, but uh, most of the park is high and dry. What would prevent a child um, during a ball game possibly wandering into that area where those train tracks are? Is there going to be some type of, like you mentioned the boardwalk with the bike trail, will that be around that area that would actually deter them from you know, entering that railroad area, the railroad track area. I'm sorry. You know, if there's a game going on, let's say in the park area, um, what would deter a small child from, you know, that mom and dad are watching the game, they're not paying attention, two small children wander off, could they actually mm -hmm. enter that railroad area there? Yeah. Where the tracks are, or will there be something to deter them, like, That'll be a decision that the park district makes, you know, how they, you know, it depends on what they're programming, right? You know, uh, if they have ball fields there, that's more of a concern, I would guess. But it is where the, where the fields are, it is, it doesn't look like it, but it is um, up a hill and significantly a, a, a distance away from the railroad tracks. Okay. But as far as any uh, protection or fencing that, that may, need, need be, may be appropriate for the railroad tracks, the park district will have to make that decision. 
Okay. And is there another park also that you're proposing for the property? Yeah, so on that side of the road, so this is a, a passive park, right? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, this is, you've driven by it. It's mm -hmm. heavily wooded. It's, it's very wet, a lot of wetland on yeah. it. We are not proposing any improvements or any grading or otherwise to that park other than the bike path connection. Okay. And, and you know, the reason I think the park district's even considering it is for that bike path, path connection. The goal is we always try to connect our bike path systems within our communities to the regional bike paths. That accomplishes that. Um, so that's really, I don't, other than walking the bike path and enjoying nature in that area, it is a beautiful area. Yeah, um, there's really no plans for any type of active recreation there at all. In the strip mall that you're proposing off of Route 59, will that have access um, through the subdivision off of West Bartlett Road, or will that access be off of Route 59 to enter into that strip mall area that you're the commercial? The commercial property. Yeah. So the, we've we've um, there is uh, the West the Cook County um, obviously owns Co uh, West Bartlett Road. So we'll be getting an access permit from them. We're confident we've met with them. We're confident we can get that access permit. Actually, we've applied for that access permit as part of our petition. Since we're applying for all the other access, we figured we'd do it all at the same point. So that'll be a full access point there. Um, and then we do have a connection into the neighborhood to keep traffic at the request of staff to keep uh, traffic um, off the road as much as possible for our residents so they don't have to enter West Bartlett clog up traffic just to go to that commercial. Sure. And then also we've, um, we are proposing, we have proposed to IDOT a right in, right out. We can't get a full access into, uh, off of Route 59 into the commercial. Okay. Um, but they, uh, they've, they can't commit until we submit a plan, right? And we're not at the point of submitting a plan until we have a user. But they have indicated that they are amenable to a right in, right out at that location. So we're very confident we can get that right in, right out. Okay. It depends on use, of course, and traffic. That's another traffic study, right? So. Thank you. But that's another petition. Thanks for answering. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, just a quick question. <clears throat> I know I asked this last time it came before us, but that uh, Grassland Way, how it has the median in the center. Um, what I was concerned about before, and I just want to make sure nothing has changed, um, that if a car breaks down there, are there still other cars that can still get through? Can emergency vehicles get through? Um, is there enough space on each side of that? Of yeah, so the median, if there is a car that breaks down or if there is an accident on, on that, the median actually provides uh, protection so that the whole passageway is not blocked, so there should still always be on, on the other each, side. Well, so, so people would have, so if there's a car broken down, they have to go into the oncoming yeah. traffic and, way? Uh, I'm trying to remember, I believe, I believe the width of the roadway, and I apologize for this, I, I don't recall exactly, I believe the entrance going in, um, I, I believe is 20 feet, and going out is 24. I can't, I don't remember exactly, but there should be enough room for passage for a car to go past there. My only concern, and, um, and when the village board looks at the minutes, and they can, when it goes before that, just to make sure that there's enough room, that if there's a car broken down, say going northbound, that you don't have to block off the other side of the road that there's enough for sure. two lanes to go through there or just maybe not have a median there. Yeah. I, I apologize, I don't, have that. I don't have that dimension with me tonight. That, that's all right, that's just something I just want to get on record. Um, and then how much, uh, how much space is that commercial area? How much, like how much retail space could actually go in there? So that's not part of our petition tonight and as I'm sitting here going through my notes, I, I, I um, I realize that question might come up, and I don't remember. What did we end up with, Christy? Was it six acres? I believe it was six acres. It w we did expand it at the request of okay. um, the mayor and staff. I was going to say, it does look bigger than last time, which, yeah. I, which, I, which I like. <clears throat> Would there be an access from in that, that subdivision or in that area to get into that commercial space, or was it only access yeah. from West Park? No, you, you can see the, the, where it, it connects. Okay, that's what, yeah, I didn't, okay. That was a request of staff as well, and actually a good one. Good. Even though we resisted early, right? <laughs> we came to our senses. Uh, no, uh, yeah, we uh, talking with our traffic consultant about it as well. You know, they agreed that it does help. I think that's important for that yeah. being there. Um, other than that, I think that's all I have. I have one one question. Uh, you're putting up a fence along West Parkland Road Correct. from Naperville to where? To uh, 59. 
Yeah, basically, um, any, wherever there's residential, we have a um, we have a nine foot berm and then a six foot fence. So um, along that entire frontage, so 15 feet. What type of fence? Uh, it'll be a board on board. Um, Wrong. Type fence. Wrong. Okay. When you drive down 59, any places that have a board on board fence looks like hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it just doesn't work. I think what you really need to do is put up the, the paddles, the brick panels along that whole wall. Uh, that way at least you're cutting down the noise that's going in. And right. I mean, that brick panel will stay there for a long time sure. rather than a board on board fence. So I, I, and I can appreciate that. I really, I mean, we, we, we build a lot of fences, we deal with a lot of fences, and um, it seems everybody has a different idea on what a proper fence is. I, I can t tell you a, a brick panel type uh, fence would be cost prohibitive for us. Um, well, that's something that, you know, something that, that's number one gonna look good and number two gonna last. Certainly. Because, I mean, after a while, it, like I say, I mean, you drive down 59, any place that has the wood fencing up, I mean, it, it's, it's deplorable. I mean, it, it, you know, it's falling down. People are trying to, you know, they put sticks up to hold it. I mean, this is ridiculous. I share your concern, you know, because I see it too. And the example I always give, if anybody goes to Schaumburg, I lived in Schaumburg for a while, but if you go along Schaumburg Road, you go, there's, um, on the north side of Schaumburg Road, there's, there's a lot of fence, wooden, wooden fences there, yeah, but there's probably 10 different types of fences along that area and they're not maintained but the difference here is this is in an, on HOA property this would be maintained by HOA property this is the same this is the same type of fence um, I, it, it looks bad if you don't maintain it you're exactly right you know it's a wooden fence it is pretty typically done but it needs to be maintained that's what HOAs are for right um, and you know it, the problem you run into is when you have individual homeowners you know, for their 80 foot wide lot, 60 foot wide lot, and then you have another home who may, may, who may maintain their fence, but then you have a neighbor next to them that continues that fence who doesn't maintain it, and it's a different style of fence. In my, my personal view, that's when it starts not looking great. But I think in this case, I, I, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised, plus it's pretty, if you look at the landscape plans, it's very heavily landscaped. Landscaping, I think you're gonna be looking at landscaping and not fencing, to be honest with you, which is our goal, so. Well, I, I appreciate your point, I though. Totally I really do. I agree with you. And uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, to me, you know, I've been on this commission for 30 years. I've been working with this stuff. And to see board on board for that length of fencing, now, that's, does that belong to the people, or does is that part of It's HOA. It'll be HOA-owned owned property, maintained and owned by the HOA. And well, I, mean, I, I haven't, I haven't, I serve on a lot of design, uh, HOA boards, but also design review committees. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when a resident in our communities submit their plans, they have to get them approved by us first, right? We deal a lot with fences. Um, I, I don't. I haven't served as long as you have, obviously. So you've you've seen a lot more than I have. But it, it's a struggle. It's difficult to making sure that we're approving the right fences. Um, but I tell you, through the years, you know, just in my 24-year tender serving on these boards, um, I you know we used to outlaw PVC fences, right? Because we didn't like the look of PVC fences. Now we approve them because they've come a long way with the quality of the fences. Um, wooden fences are very popular, very commonly used, uh, and they can look really good, um, but they have to be maintained. And again, I think that's what the HOA, where the HOA comes in. Jerry, we did put in the condition that these, uh, the wood fence would have to have the metal post as, as you have always instructed staff to do. So I just wanna let you know. But that's still, I mean, you know, like I say, whether you've got steel posts or not to hold up the fence, I mean, you know, it deteriorates. And then it looks, it looks like hell. It really does. I mean, you go and past think, any of them, any place that has a wooden fence, it, you know, they're falling apart. They're, I mean. And I think the, the, the staff can enforce that if it's falling down. That's what code enforcement can do. So, and we can contact the HOA and stay on them with that. So 
That, that's part of our job. I still think that that would look a lot better, like a stone wall up there. That would look a lot better than the board on board fence, even if it has the steel post. Um, I do love this property. I think it's going to be just beautiful. Um, so I, I don't want to do anything to discourage it because I think it's just going to be such an asset to the community. Um, and I, I do feel that you'll hopefully take care of that with fence. And I, I think that the housing values in that neighborhood, you know, are going to demand that anyways. Um, but uh, the question that I have is the, re the commercial property with the entrance off of Route 59. And I just want it to be on the record that um, it's a very dangerous intersection with just approaching. And that's, you know, once you're down there, it's okay at, at some points. But it's just the entrance into the commercial property. If you do gain entrance from, route 50, from IDOT for 59, um, I don't know if that's going to help the problem or make it worse because then people are going to start pulling in there, which will slow them down because that's part of the problem is when they're coming down the hill, they're not slowing and they're not realizing there's a light there. Um, and I know that we are under a lot of, um, are we having revisions done to that intersection? Is there something going on over there? Are we gonna have like a right turn lane or something? I was just gonna mention that. So um, that's not part of our petition tonight. We will be back before you for that final okay. plan petition. Uh, we'll also, IDOT will scrutinize our, our plan uh, quite a bit, as will um, the village, as will, um, Cook County, because we're all going to be access to that. But that'll that'll come back. That'll be a, uh, in a, a different uh, traffic report re regard, regarding that. But I can tell you as an engineer, um, most agencies, most uh, road districts love right-in, right-outs. They work really well. They get the traffic off the road. They get them back on. There's usually a turn. There's a, a right turn lane into that right-in, right-out, yeah, so you get out of the lane of traffic. But also, to your point, um, and I believe it's happening next year, hopefully. Um, IDOT has been, it, it's been a, it's a broken intersection. It has been for a long time, right? IDOT is aware of that. Um, and, but they do have plans, and um, I believe they have funding, most importantly, to make the improvements to West Bartlett Road and Route 59, which uh, creates probably the, you know, the, almost the biggest intersection you can create, which is two turn lanes in every direction, right turn lanes, dual lefts. That's going to have a huge impact on the... Uh, safety of that intersection and the flow of traffic. So I think, um, like I said, help. even you know the commercial property might even make it safer. You know, that just if they're they're seeing it as they're coming down, that people are slowing. There's something going on over there. Right, of right in, right outs take traffic off the road before they get to the light to the okay. intersection, and that helps. Right, the fewer traffic sure. you can get because the conflicts occur at the lights. Right, okay. so if you can get the traffic off, it does absolutely help. Thank you. Mr. Olson. Uh, all these naturalized areas in the stormwater area, in the wetland, and yep. what have you, uh, what kind of maintenance are those going to take that the Homeowners Association will have? So, um, you know, one of our, uh, our first communities, uh, you know, we're in, in Naperville, we did Stonebridge, we did Oakhurst, but the first community I was involved with, with was Thornwood in South Elgin. And, you know, as the engineer, um, you know, that was back in the day when everybody was doing blue water detention ponds or dry detention ponds. And um, working with our consultants proposed wetland-based detention ponds there. So, um, you know, and we were concerned that they would they uh, that they wouldn't be uh, the the marketable, right? People backing up to them. It turned out people started appreciating those types of spaces, but they do require maintenance, right? And so we you know, we like to think of ourselves as pioneers in Kane County as far as wetland-based detention. We do it in our Hampshire properties. We do it in our Elgin properties. But um, as the HOA as a member, as board member of HOA, we, we do budget for maintenance of those facilities. Um, prescribed burns is one way to do that. Um, that can be difficult because it's always dependent on weather and humidity levels and all that stuff, so you gotta hit the window just right. Plus, if you got homes near there, it becomes more of an issue. What we found is that it actually works, it's better if you do a prescribed mow, which is where you go in and you mow everything, and then it's, it's labor intensive, but then you go in um, uh, and you, you spot herbicide invasive weeds, right? First of all, you plant it, right? You gotta make sure you plant it right, but then after it gets some growth, you mow it, you, you, you spot herbicide, all these areas where the invasive weeds are, and slowly choke those weeds out with the desirable plants. 
So that's the intent here. Again, owned by the HOA, it'll be the HOA's responsibility to make sure they do that. There is a backup SSA that will, get, will ensure, that gives the village the enforcement to make sure that they do that. We're certainly, you know, we're not the developer. We're, you know, we're you typically develop ourselves, but our un un player. Understood, you know, they, they, without the maintenance, of course, they can turn into a mud flat at, after a couple of cycles. So you want them all nice and stabilized and everything, but how do we know looking at it that that's what's going to happen in the future in these areas i, I think um first of all the residents it, first of all it's going to be a, the hoa so you have yeah you don't it isn't like a bunch of residents getting together and saying let's you know let's let's keep it looking good that doesn't happen right hoa they there's a lot of these around hoas are familiar with how to maintain these these facilities mm -hmm. the property managers are mm -hmm. but also i would say if it doesn't happen there will be a backup ssa in place which gives you the authority to Go in and do it. I know that's not, you're not in the business of it, but then you can you can use the uh, the SSA. Kind of the same as defense, it. huh? Right. Yeah. There, there, my, my point being, there's an enforcement that can, that mechanism with the village right. to make sure it happens. Right. So as I'm looking at the the site plan, I'm I'm seeing one open water area there, in the. Uh, oh yeah, right there. Yes, correct. Northwest parcel and and the rest of that is naturalized. Correct. Okay. Got it. Got it. I want to commend the landscape plan and the elaborate good. and beautiful nature of the boulevard and you know we don't we don't gush about things very much on no. land commission at all but that berm and the and and the layout of the thing is uh creative uh it's interesting it's filled with public spaces and public paths yeah. it's uh, you know you there's been a lot of care taken on this site plan and it'd be a gorgeous community. Thank you for that. Uh, I wish he was here tonight. He's been at the other public hearings. This is probably the first meeting. Our plan he's, he's our planner and our landscape architect. I will uh, ask you this. The best in the world uh, in our Since, uh, because our, our staff report says um, that the exhibits are in substantial, com uh, yeah, com substantially similar or whatever to what was presented last time. So besides the retail area, what else was tweaked? Well, the retail area actually uh, got changed uh, very late in the process. I believe, I believe uh, at the mayor's request, one of the last meetings we made the change. It was a right change, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. But we got it done. So that's that. The change to the retail is is uh, per the approved preliminary plans uh, right now. So um, so I don't know that there's there really wasn't anything. anything. Yeah. Wasn't anything else other than that? My review of their plans was very easy. Okay. Christy okay. was looking for mistakes, I guarantee you. Yes. Yes. All right, <laughs> all right. I have a couple of uh, questions for staff, if that's okay. Uh, one of them is that uh, if, as we approve something uh, and set the PUD, is there a timeout? If something doesn't happen over a specific period of time, um, what happens? We have deadlines in our uh, the development agreement. Mm-hmm. Okay, well that goes along with the last finding of fact in, in the report, and that is that uh, the project needs to proceed according to its schedule, but I didn't see a schedule. That's all in the development agreement? The yeah. By it's not too helpful to us though, <laughs> right? I see. I can, and it is in the development agreement, but I, I can assure you, um, again, okay. we're, you know, we are, we're not home builders. We are land developers. Typically, we do our own land development. In this case, the builder is doing the land development. We're doing the entitlement, but um, it's a national builder. Uh, we're still negotiating a contract. I can't divulge who it is right now. You may know, uh, but I will say um, national builders don't sit on property. Uh, once they close on a property, and we're, we're hoping to close in the next few months, um, they move. They they want to they want to get going. They want to get done as quickly as they can. And that's not the market is very 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 you know hot right now. <laughs> so we shouldn't be sitting and improving things we don't see. And so that that condition is a little bit tough for us. So to go along with um, the final developer, my last question is uh, in terms of the building elevations. It says staff's going to determine. Uh, if the final proposed elevations by the final developer are similar to the ones that were 
attached and approved, what constitutes substantially similar? So what would constitute not being substantially similar? If we, for what we received in the preliminary approval, we see that there were multiple elevations, very different four options, four to five options for each housing type. We do not just want to have box homes all in a row where all the changes really is the siding color. We don't want flat elevations. We want bump outs. We want roof changes. The, 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 th and the, the whole reason for this is unfortunately our first buyer um, decided to pass on the project, but the, the exhibits that you see in our development agreement and in, in, in Christie's report are theirs, right? Um, we didn't anticipate that we would be in this position. They were very excited about the project and you know, for reasons um, not, not, not due to us or the village, or it was, it was a corporate decision down in Atlanta. Um, that they decided not to pursue this project. Um, but we always have, our lawyers are good, they always have backups. What if they decide to walk away? We're like, well, they're not gonna walk away, right? Well, they walked away, but that's, that's how that provision got in there. But to try to, to, try to define what is a substantial uh, deviation from those plans, who are their com competitors' plans, um, it, it would really, they'd be building the same product if we said, you know, you gotta build this. Well, they're not going to build it, the same product, but at the same time, you don't want to define what, you know, what, what is quality, what is not. And this is all about quality, right? So we agreed to give that authority to staff. What we didn't want to get into is having to come back through a public hearing, to be candid, come back through a public hearing process to amend a whole new set of plans for that. But the authority does, does lie with the village and the staff. So it's, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they have, and actually, we, we've with our our we our, and our buyers. We'd our, like to know. Our, our buyers have submitted elevations. Staff has reviewed them. They provided comments, um, uh, and we need we're responding back to them. So we're not there yet. The authority again lies with the village. The village can say no. It just doesn't look right, right, without giving an explanation. So it lies with the village. We think you'll be very happy with the elevations once we get. Feels good to give staff a hard time now and then. So, anyone else have any questions or comments? Yeah. On the plat that shows the uh, walkway under Route 59, it says by others. Who is others? like to say that I have some concerns uh, right over here in the findings of fact number two where it says the flat unit development is designed located and proposed to be operated and maintained so that the public health safety and welfare will not be endangered or detrimentally affected this underpass under 59 is definitely a, a safety hazard and this exit from the uh, commercial into the residential street is also a problem uh, otherwise uh, the rest of the development is fine, but those two things are a concern that need to be really addressed better than what they're doing. Okay, if there's no other questions or comments, do we have a motion to approve the final mm -hmm. subdivision PUD plat and phase one final PUD plan and the uh, recommendations and findings of fact? So moved. Second. Is there any other discussions? Secretary, call the roll. Mayor Callis? Yes. Mark Hopkins? Yes. John Miasso? Yes. Julie Kapitakakis? Yes. Austin Hopkins? Yes. Jim Lemberg? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Yes. Uh, next item on the agenda is old business, new business. Um, so I have been informed that we have some old business and um, I think
think Ray Daney would like to um, say a few words. <laughs> no, you said old first. <laughs> The, the mayor. Of course. <laughs> mayor. I thought you were going. Uh, Good evening. Just state your name and address, please. Uh, Kevin Wallace, uh, 114 Pipers Drive, Bartlett, Illinois. It's kind of odd being on this side. Um, but good evening, uh, Chairman Lindbergh and co uh, committee commissioners. Um, and after watching the review here, I'm very happy that we have the right people in that job. Um, in 2017, the board asked um, staff to look into the idea of combining the CBA and, to, and the planned commission into one commission. And I had met with, um, I think a year and a half ago, with, with uh, Chairman Lindbergh and Chairman Weirden, talked about it a little bit, gave it a little bit of time. But that request uh, came from the complete review of the development process. Um, the village did, an, an, eff, uh, did an, in an effort to have more a streamlined process from start to finish. Um, just so you know, I gave a great deal of thought, had a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings um, about uh, who's gonna be appointed to the new commission. And, um, and those appointments are going to be before the board, uh, the village board this next Tuesday. Um, uh, Ray Daney, obviously he was the chair here for a thousand years, was it? 34 years. Um, he had a, 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 he's been on both boards and he provided me with some really, really good input on the direction of the combined commission. Um, and I really uh, appreciate all the thoughtful concern that this planning um, commission has given to the village um, for so many years. Um, it's a difficult attrition thing that's going on now with a lot of villages and the speed of which um, things need to be happening and building and, and um, the process of it. Um, but with that, I will turn it over to my good friend and fellow trustee, Ray Daney. Good evening, commissioners. I only have one thing to say. I've sat on my ass so long I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> but uh, Jerry, I love you, man. You're still my fence guy. I remember going back years and years ago, always talking about fences and whatnot, you know. And, uh, and Mark, I don't know what happened to you. You didn't talk this long years ago. I mean, you could go on and on, you know. But. Uh, but I don't think I need to introduce myself. I think all of you guys know who I am. And uh, I've had a great privilege over the years, 34 years as a matter of fact, serving in a commission with, uh, with most of you. You know, it's pretty amazing. And uh, yeah, I was appointed by Glenn Kohler back in uh, 1981. And the uh, story behind that is Lee Grex was on the, uh, the board and uh, he was running against Lee Grex, and Lee Grex was born here in the village, born and raised here in the village. And we were newcomers in the uh, village, and uh, we actively campaigned for Lee Grex. Well, Lee Grex lost the election. And uh, it was a Sunday morning, about 10 o'clock, and uh, Mr. Kohler called our house. And uh, Peg and I had only lived here about a year after, you know, a couple years. and. Uh, Mr. Kohler said to me, he says, Ray, he says, uh, can you come down to Village Hall? On Monday, I'd like to speak with you. And uh, I said, yes, I will, Mr. Kohler. I'll be down there. Hung up the phone, and I told my wife, I says, you know what, Peg? We've only lived here a few years, and we're getting our ass kicked out of the village. <laughs> so anyway, he asked me to serve on the plan commission, and, uh, and uh, El Monagrano was chairman at that time. You remember, Jim. And I uh, served two years one or two years and then he dropped off and I was appointed chairman of the uh, plan commission after that. And I served on that commission till uh, 2015 when uh, the election was up and T.L. Aarons was running and uh, she asked me, she said, uh, would, you, uh, would you sign my petition? And we were at the fire barn. We had just had a dedication for Bill Tickness. We placed a sign down here at Bartlett Park and uh, T.L. said to me, she says, uh, I'll sign your petition 
And I said, uh, TL, I'm not running. And she said, yes, you are. She said, you get your butt down to Village Hall on Monday morning, you pick up a packet, you're going to run. And that's what happened. So, so now we're sitting here in 2022, and, uh, and I got elected in, for second term. But, uh, but I just want to say it was a real privilege on my part to serve with all of you. And uh, we're moving on, as Kevin had said, we're streamlining the process for developers in our, in our village. But so much, so much of it is dependent upon what you guys did. So thank you. Thank you for your service. It's been a pleasure working with all of you, truly. And we do have some light refreshments in the back room there, if you would care to indulge. But thank, thank you immensely. And one last thing, after we have our cake, you're all invited over to Pasta Mia for cocktail. Kevin's buying. <laughs> okay, no further old business, new business. And we have a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Adjourn.